The Sioux and Cheyenne were astounded to see what they viewed as the retreat of half of the cavalry facing them. As such, the nearly 1,000 warriors turned their attention to the exposed and vulnerable force of Royal's battalion. It consisted of five companies, but it would soon become only four companies. These roughly 200 men, with one in four of them holding the horses, were about to have the fight of their lives. The advanced element of Crooks and Run was a big battalion that Captain Mills led, consisting of his three companies of the 3rd Cavalry and Noya's five companies of the 2nd Cavalry. This force began its advance up the Rosebud while Royal was in his advanced position. In that position, things got bizarre for Royal's force. He ordered Captain Andrews' I Company to advance to the northwest to clear a portion of the ridge while he halted and dismounted the other four companies in a defensive position. He would hold this for about an hour under constant harassment from all sides. The 54-year-old Captain Andrews, in his futile chasing of the Sioux, ordered one of his two platoons under Lieutenant Foster, which was just 19 men in all, to charge the Indians on the left, or the south. Foster drove the warriors before him with ease. And in his vigor, Foster had moved out of support from the rest of the command. Seeing Indians ready to swarm him, he ordered the retreat. He halted temporarily when two couriers, one from Royal and another from Andrews, advised him to get the hell out of there. Under constant pursuit, Foster's group somehow shot their way back to safety, suffering only two wounded. Andrews had had enough also, and he retired to Royal's now-forming skirmish line. As for that line, it was under pressure from three sides, and Royal was preparing to charge the Sioux again. However, General Crook intervened. He ordered Royal to connect with the main body, or what was left of it. Royal ordered Meinhold to extend the line to Crook's Hill, but that was impossible, so Meinhold, on his own initiative, took his company and ended up joining and remaining with the other two companies under Van Vliet and Evans. This left Royal with only 157 men on the skirmish line and 210 total when you count the horse holders. Seeing Meinhold's company gallop back under fire, a worried and perplexed crook then sent one of his aides, Captain Nickerson, with a directive for Royal to withdraw completely. Nickerson galloped to Royal, delivered the message, and galloped back, surrounded by a storm of bullets. Royal's only option to conduct a retrograde was to move to his left along the southern shoulder of Colmar Creek. The four companies started a slow fighting withdrawal. As you can imagine, the warriors seeing this became more emboldened and repeatedly launched charges against the command, but were repelled each time. Royal, who was anxious to get his command mounted and break contact, finally found an opportunity, and he ordered Company L into the swale to offer protection while the rest of the command moved to the horses in a ravine. As the command rushed to the creek bottom, all hell broke loose. The valiant efforts of the officers and non-commissioned officers prevented an almost certain collapse. The first sergeant of Company I, John Henry Shingle, was heard above the din of battle, hollering, Face them, men! Damn them! Face them! This and his other efforts would earn him the Medal of Honor. As the fighting turned into a melee, and in many cases hand-to-hand, Captain Randall arrived in the nick of time with his Crow and Shoshone scouts, charging into the fray and allowing the troopers to get to their mounts. And in one of the most amazing human interest stories of the Plains Wars, Captain Guy Henry, leading D Company, was shot through the face. The bullet entered below his left eye and exited below his right eye. Henry described the incident after being shot, quote, I retained my saddle for a moment, then dismounted and lay on the ground, unquote. There are a number of different testimonies about what happened next. The most probable was that several warriors were closing in on Henry when at least one of the scouts during their charge got to his body and provided protection. 
Henry himself remembered that a friendly Indian, quote, provided him protection, unquote. That protection allowed Henry's unidentified orderly and several other troopers to secure him and get him safely off the field and to the hospital at the base of Crooks Hill. By all accounts, Henry was one of the most admired officers on the field that day, and the idea of his men coming to his rescue conjures up the thought of the troopers of the 7th Cavalry trying to protect Captain Keogh at the Little Bighorn without success. Royal was an experienced Indian fighter as it goes, and knowing he was in trouble, he dispatched a rider to Crook requesting immediate assistance. By the time that message from Royal was delivered to Crook, he had already figured out that things were going to hell in a handbasket. Therefore, Crook dispatched Burroughs and Burt's infantry companies to assist. Dismounted, the two companies double timed to the ridge and opened fire with their long range Springfield rifles. They prevented a large force of Indians from moving down the northern shoulder of Colmar Creek to get in behind Royal and cut off his escape. Forget about Custer and his not bringing those damn Gatling guns. He needed infantrymen on mules. Anyway, Crook had three cavalry companies at his disposal, but apparently never considered committing them. Was he saving them for the drive on the mythical village downstream on the Rosebud? Sure seems that way. It, it, it certainly appears that, that Crook was fixated on the village. It, 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 this is interestingly similar to the World War II battle at Lady Gulf, where one of my all-time favorite commanders, Admiral Bull Halsey, fixated on those Japanese aircraft carriers. And it almost led to a catastrophic defeat. Stay tuned for that, because in a couple of months, I'm going to dive into the Philippines campaign of World War II. As I learned in one of my military history courses, there are way too many myths about that campaign. Okay, back to the task at hand. Vroom's Company L bore the brunt of the attack, and it suffered five killed and three wounded, which was the highest number of casualties for any company on the field that day. One of the troopers, Private Richard Bennett, was shot at point-blank range during the Sioux charge and fell near some rocks that obscured him. Well, during the Sioux retreat, he must have thought it was the crows passing over him as he suddenly rose up and was consequently clubbed to death and horribly mutilated. Two men from F Company were cut down when they ran out of ammunition. Three men from F Company charged, recovered the bodies, but then had to abandon them uh, during another Sioux assault. Another amazing story is where Private Phineas Town of F Company was shot in the abdomen. And as he lay on the ground in agony, an Indian jumped on him, took his carbine, and knocked him unconscious. He came to and realized he was being dragged away by a pony with a lariat around his foot. His comrades rescued him, and he lived to tell the tale for many years to come. Finally, Royal's command was able to mount their horses and dash to the protection of the infantry line and the base of Crooks Hill. Reportedly, the last soldier out of the creek was Royal himself. But this was all only possible because of the cover provided by the Crow and Shoshone warriors. If not for them, it would have been a massive slaughter. And of the nine soldiers killed this day in Crook's command, all were from this fight in Colmar Creek. It was now about 1,300 hours. Well, what of the end run by the Mills Battalion? Crook, realizing that Royal was in extreme peril, sent Captain Nickerson off once again, this time with a message for Mills to return. So Nickerson, dressed in his buckskin and an unnamed orderly road to Big Bend, then three miles up the Rosebud, where he encountered the command preparing for combat as they fully expected to run into a large village up ahead. The reporter Finnerty heard Nickerson shout to Mills, the general orders that you annoy us defile by your left flank out of this canyon and fall on the rear of the Indians who are pressing royal. The order was not welcomed by the command, but nonetheless obeyed. Mills and Noyes moved in parallel columns west, then south towards Crooks Hill, with the Crow and Shoshones creating the time and space for Royal to escape, and the appearance of Mills and Noyes, the exhausted Sioux and Cheyenne, 
begin to head north. A perplexed Mills approached Crook and asked him what had happened. Crook answered, I found it a more serious engagement than I thought. We have lost about 50 killed and wounded, and the doctors refused to remain with the wounded unless I left the infantry and one of the squadrons with them. I knew I could not keep my promise to support you with the remainder of the force. The fight was over, but the drama continued. With his force consolidated, Crook personally led the cavalry and scouts to the Big Bend. When he reached it, the Indians refused to continue. Through the interpreter, Big Bat Poirier, the Crows let the general know that in a prior fight with the Sioux, they had been enticed into this defile and massacred. Crook pleaded with them to continue, but they advised the general that they had wounded to take care of and were returning to camp. This surprise, along with a sudden concern about the amount of ammunition in some of the companies, prompted Crook to give up the operation. The command returned to its morning bivouac on the Rosebud. It was 1,600 hours.